Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the tournament director for the Memphis Open Tennis Tournament, Aaron Mazarek. <laughs> No need to be concerned with deflated tennis balls next week when the ATP Tour makes its annual stop in Memphis. Deflate gate is not an issue, but the long-standing Memphis tennis event will be different in more ways than one. First, the tournament is now being run by the United States Tennis Association. Yes, the same people that run the U.S. Open in New York. Two, the event has a new name, the Memphis Open. No sparkles, no frills, just a matter of fact, right to the point name. And three, the event has a new tournament director in Aaron Mazarek, who just happens to be the first female tournament director in the history of the Memphis event. And with it comes a new fan-friendly philosophy and a move from the more reserved tennis fan to what will hopefully become a younger fan base, who will look at the event as more than a tennis tournament, but also a happening in which people want to gravitate to. Qualifying begins this Saturday with play in the main draw starting on Monday. And today I'm joined by Aaron to look at the changes and discuss the field. And it's next on Sports Files. Aaron, I know how busy it is for you. We have a tournament starting this Saturday. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. How has the city of Memphis treated you so far <laughs> since you've been here? I love it. I love it here. It's not even been three full months, so I'm asking people to give me a little uh, forgiveness on not visiting all the Memphis sites just yet, but I will. The people have been so friendly. This town is very warm and welcoming, and I'm really excited to make it my new home. You're from Michigan. You've worked in Michigan. Now you come to the South. What was, what was it about this job that was so appealing to you? You know, I just, I really love the sport of tennis. I'm a true fan, uh, although I'm a business person at heart, a, right. a little bit different with the level of experience I bring to this job, just having the business acumen. But the sport of tennis is great. I, I play recreationally. This climate is lovely. Everything I saw about Memphis and the people and the sites here, and really this job, just the chance to be part of something that is going to be a rebirth of pro tennis here in the Mid-South, in Memphis, and in this region, it's going to be big, and it's going to be a new day for this tournament. And to be here breaking ground and charging forward, I'm, I'm excited to do that. What do you think the biggest challenge or challenges are for you? I think um, coming into something with such deep roots in a history that has such an established, his that has established history, right. that lends to a set of challenges, as well as opportunities, of course. Uh, but getting people to see this as a new day and age for this tennis tournament, we're going to be doing things a lot differently moving forward. Uh, we just have a different set of perspective and a different look at the, how we want to manage this. But getting the community to embrace it as something new and fresh, that'll probably be a little bit of a challenge. So we're looking forward to tackling that this year. When you were looking at the opportunity to come here and take over as tournament director, I'm sure you did your homework. You started to look at the history of this tournament. And you are a tennis buff. You're young, but you probably know a lot about the history. It probably blew you away <laughs> to look at the names that have won titles here in Memphis and some of the great players, both men and women, that have come here and played over the years. Yeah, it, it's really fantastic. You know, when I walked down the hall at the Racquet Club of Memphis on my, one of my interview weekends and saw those posters and, and plaques of past champions, it was truly awe-inspiring. I mean, to know that... This has been the home to so many tennis greats, and you've seen people like John McEnroe and Jimmy Connors, and then when the women were here, you had Venus Williams, and it's so many, so many true champions of the sport and, and legends in their own right. It, it's special. It's something that we know that the community is proud of, as they right, should be, right. and it definitely played a part in making this decision. 
Let's talk about your, your, your recent history, which was in the NHL. Of course, the, the business side of things with the Detroit Red Wings. But right before that, you do have the tennis background because of the USTA Pro Circuit Women's Event. So that right. got you ready for trying to tackle something like this, although much bigger. You certainly got some experience from that. I'll tell you, my experience in Midland, we had the uh, Dow Corning Tennis Classic, and it is a longstanding, known as one of kind of the marquee events, but it's not even on the WTA level. It's, right. a, it's a level below that. And yet, these are women ranked in the 200s. You wouldn't have known a single name, but we pack the house every single night. And this is February in Michigan was a real winter. <laughs> Y'all don't have real winter right. down here, so, which I like. But uh, I think we learned a lot of really good lessons, and I, I trained under one of the best. Uh, Mike Woody is one of the best in the sport, and having learned under him and seen how we could bring life to a town in the month of February that's, that's generally slow around a sporting event that is nowhere near the level of the tennis here, those are the kinds of pieces we're going to put into play in Memphis. It needs to be about an event. There needs to be an excitement in the air. It needs to right. be a great place to dine and drink and interact with your friends. It's The tennis is always going to be a showcase piece of the puzzle, but all the other pieces of the puzzle have to come into play too, and we're going to really revive those. From the tennis in Midland, you take a job with the Red Wings. Is there anything you could take from working for a hockey organization into this new job with tennis. It's totally different fan base. A little bit different, yeah, right? It's just a little bit different. Um, you know, the principles of sport and the principles of professional sport management are, are very similar, no matter whether you're in golf or tennis or hockey or baseball. I think that the consumer is becoming more and more savvy to what they want, what they expect. Uh, they want their experience to be optimized. They expect the best of the best when it comes to their parking experience, their dining experience, their ticketing experience, and then the in-game elements that you bring to them. They're demanding a lot more of us, which is why I think us as professionals in this industry, in the sports industry, need to continue to raise the bar and step our game up across all platforms, uh, which is why I really believe it makes no difference whether I had been most immediately in professional soccer or in hockey as I was, or if I came straight from another tennis tournament, the, the principles of the sport and the demands of the consumer are the same. And those lessons I learned with the Red Wings will apply very, uh, very easily here in town. Aaron, you've been hitting on the, the, the general theme of it's really a new day for professional tennis in Memphis with the Memphis Open, with what you guys are bringing to the table. And a big part of that is the association now with the United States Tennis Association, yeah. the USTA. Talk about that relationship and, and what it'll mean as far as the fans go and what they're going to see in Memphis starting this Saturday. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting when the people that run your tournament, all they do is tennis. We're the USTA. All we care about is the game and the mm -hmm. sport of tennis, growing it from the grassroots to the professional levels. This is what we do. 365 days a year, we are focused on tennis. And I think it's really should be really exciting for the people of Memphis to have us come in and help lead the charge on the tournament because this is what we do best. And with the lessons learned through the U.S. Open, arguably the largest tennis event in the entire world, right. one of the four Grand Slams, we've got this level of professional acumen and, and experience in the world of pro tennis and events that we're now going to be able to tap into for Memphis. And that's something, you know, aside from the U.S. Open, this is the only other professional tournament that the USTA operates. And I think that should really resound with people. Obviously, the USTA is involved all across the United States in a number of ways. But nowhere besides New York and Flushing Meadows are they more active mm -hmm. in running a tennis tournament than right here in this hometown. And that should really help step the game up from every level of the organization and the execution of what we do around this tournament. Let's talk about the field. Uh, Nisha Corey's coming back, the defending champion. Isner and the better Americans are certainly going to be here. What challenges faced you in trying to put together this field? Yeah, I think uh, players have a lot of choices these days. Um, there's three tournaments for every single week of the year. So wow. there's choices and there's stops they can make. And, you know, I was sharing this uh, in, in my months leading up to the tournament here is trying to just educate the consumer on the difference between a 250 and a 500. And, mm -hmm. and truly, there, there really isn't much difference. Sure, there's a, a point difference, but 
neither one is is a required play for a right. player. It's probably locale is more of the difference maker, right? It's it's location. What mm -hmm. continent do they want to be on? What kind of surface do they want to play on for that week of the year? Are they training on grass leading up to Wimbledon? Are they training on hard court leading up to the U.S. Open? We're lucky because we've got Indian Wells, which is a great anchor tournament in March. So people are coming, players are coming over to the United States, getting ready to play in Indian Wells. Uh, and we've got the reputation and the history, which bodes really well with the players. But it will always be, players will always want to play on their home soil or their home turf, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, and I think being able to secure the top five Americans in the top 100 to come play Memphis is just an example. You always want to play in your home turf. So I, I think, you know, certainly the, the challenge always will remain in what are their other choices this week of the year. But I feel really good about our draw. We've got... You know, four players in the top 30. We've got a number five in the world who's had the most amazing year. Kaney Shikori is just right. on fire. He did he did go down in the quarters of the Australian, but that's, Good that's, run, not, though. that's not too shabby. We're pretty proud of that. Uh, I think the players that have played here over the years, I've been here 20 years, they always talk about the, the intimate setting. They love the racket club, so, so they like it. The fans, as we just talked about moments ago, they want more than just the tennis. They mm -hmm. want more than just watching uh, some guys hit, hit the ball. They right. want to have an experience. And you said you want to make it an experience for yeah. them. So what is there this year and then things that maybe you're looking at in the future yeah. that will coincide with the tennis? You know, I think uh, a few things that fans can expect to see. We've hired the company that produces the show at the U.S. Open, Fear Productions. Oh, wow. Fear is going to be coming into Memphis and executing our day of run of show. Everything from having an in-stadium DJ for every single evening match, playing tunes between the changeovers, uh, the integration of the messaging and the scoreboard. We've added a second uh, eight-foot LED scoreboard on the opposite end of the court to integrate more um, animations and more activity and we've done things like added entertainment every night before the matches we've completely redesigned what used to be called the fan village into what we're now calling the mo which stands for memphis open and the mo is going to have a performance stage that features nightly acts uh, we're going to have the lion king opening up monday's opening night ceremonies wow. you know, there's just going to be a lot more excitement around this year's event and a lot more elements that enhance the show is there anything that you're looking forward to down the road that you can talk about that you would love to implement? Well, we bit off a lot of ideas for our short window here for 2015. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're just glad to be ready to start a fantastic week ahead of us. Take care of year one for you, right? Before year you one, year one under our belts. But this is a stepping stone. We have big plans in the future, and we're here for the long haul. So we'll see in continual improvement. How are ticket sales going? How can people get tickets and also look at the schedule, talk uh, and, and see what type of events you're talking about actually in front of them so they can decide which day is better for them or days, yeah. if you will? Yeah, tickets are still available and they're available through our website, which is very simple, memphisopen.com. Or they can come in any day starting this weekend to the box office and we can show them live what seats are still available. Uh, we've got a couple special events. Monday night kicks off with James Blake, former runner up, right. and I know a fan favorite here in Memphis, versus Michael Chang, former champion. The two of them are going to kick off Monday night with a singles exhibition match. So that's going to be fun and exciting. Monday's also the day the Lion King performs. And we've got the Grizzlies coach Yeager doing our coin flip to start the night off. Monday's going to be a hot night. It's going to be a night people want to be there. And, and Michael Chang is the coach of Nishikori. Correct. And uh, we, uh, we had a chance to see him last year as a coach, of course, many years here uh, as, a, as a player. But things get underway on s this Saturday, correct? Correct. we got some qualifying going on? Right. February 7th and 8th are our qualifying rounds, Saturday and Sunday. Tickets are as low as $10. We've right-sized the prices, which is just bringing the price points down to make them more affordable and accessible for all fans. We want people to come out and experience it. If you've never been, if you're a casual fan, just come check it out. It's a great activity for a, a midwinter weekend. And then starting the rest of the week, there's a lot more to do. And, and ticket prices range in the 25 to 35 range for a chair seat. And what I think is really noteworthy that people might forget is you will never get this close to the players right. for this price point. In a town like this, it's such an intimate experience. If you buy a 
$35 ticket at the U.S. Open, you're, you're surely going to be in the upper bowl pretty pretty much squinting down at the players, which this is an it's experience like no other. Absolutely. Aaron, we like to end all our interviews with something called Five for the Road. I'm going to give you five questions. First thing that comes to mind. So very quick answers. Favorite pro team? Detroit Red Wings. <laughs> I, I figured that one now. Favorite pro athlete of all time? Oh, well, oh, gosh. Could Steve, be any sport. Steve Eiserman. Stevie Y. And Serena Williams. There you go. Big, big idol. Favorite music? What do you like to listen to? Maybe a, a kind of music or a group or an individual? Uh, top 20. Top 20 chart hits. So, yeah, top 20, top 40. Yeah. The pop, the pop yeah, music. pop music. Okay. Favorite movie of all time? Forrest Gump. <laughs> Why? I'm a sucker for this. It's just such a good story. <laughs> uh, and he played ping pong, not tennis. But, you know, uh, it's true. sort of. Table and tennis, it, There actually. you go. There you go. Table tennis. And your favorite television show of all time? Pretty much anything on HGTV. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a home network. I want to see you rehab my backyard. That's, that's my favorite <laughs> thing to watch. <laughs> Aaron, listen, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. We wish you nothing but the best. We look forward to going over and watching great tennis this uh, next uh, 10 days or so. And best of luck here in Memphis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'll take a short break. Overtime is coming up next. With the success of the Memphis Grizzlies comes more attention, whether it be locally, regionally, or even nationally. Local television, radio, and print outlets have always been there. But in this day and age of modern technology and social media, the Internet has often become the go-to outlet for Grizz news. And while many sites do a good job, Three Shades of Blue has established itself as the most thorough, reliable, and creative site to follow the Grizzlies at. The site was the brainchild of Josh Coleman, who hooked up with Chip Crane to get things in motion. 3SOB.com features a number of skilled writers, such as Steve Danziger, the New Yorker who contributes with pregame previews, and Memphian Zach Thomas, who is there after the games to give you that angle, which includes the player's perspective. Three Shades also has a weekly radio show with Josh, Jonathan May, the local attorney who still carves out ample time to talk Grizz, and Philip D. There are just too many names to mention. But take it from me, no stone is unturned at Three Shades of Blue. They also host golf and bowling events, as well as Grizzlies watch parties. And that's where I recently caught up with Josh and Chip. Josh, let me start with you. How did you come up with the idea for this blog, Three Shades of Blue, and then how did you get things going and, and get it in gear? Well, back in March of 07 is when I decided to start it, and really it was just a matter of, of seeing a need out there. You know, all of our information was coming from either Ron Tillery with the Commercial Appeal or, you know, through national guys that didn't necessarily have a, a good pulse of the team because, again, it was, it was in the middle of a, a year where the team wasn't very good, quite frankly. You know, we were, we were hoping for the, the Odin Durant draft, and that's, that's when, you know, it just kind of struck me that there's a bunch of information out there. If I can put it all in one spot and, and hopefully give a unique analysis of it, then maybe, you know, that'll give fans something else to look for. The next move was to get in contact with, with Chip Crane here, and then the thing really got going. Chip, uh, tell me about your relationship with Josh, and then when he came with you uh, to you with this idea, what did you think? Well, Josh and I had met each other on the Grizzlies message board, and we'd become good friends, actually. And uh, he told me he was starting a blog and asked if I'd write on it, and I didn't think I'd have anything to say. And he goes, well, just try it. And we talked about it a few times. And then uh, as a lark one night, we were all going to get together and talk about the Grizzlies at the uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. And uh, we just hired Chris Wallace as the new general manager. I said, I'm going to send him an email and see if he'll come and join us. And it was a joke. I didn't think it was, I had the right email address. And if I did, it would get screened out or Chris would say no if he got to him. And while we were laughing about me doing this silly thing, he responded back, sounds like fun, I'll be there. Uh, he shows up, he talks to us for two and a half hours, answered all of our questions, it was just the great Chris Wallace guy that he is. And at the end I said, Do you, this, Josh has been bugging me to write for his blog, can I write about this? And I did, and he said yes, and I did. And uh, the next day Josh called me about two in the afternoon and asked me what I'd done to the blog. And 
since it was my first blog, I thought I'd broken it somehow, and I didn't know what he was talking about, and he told us we had like 20,000 hits, I think, at that yeah, point. Yeah, ended up being over 30,000. Over 30,000 hits the first day. ESPN found out about the blog somehow, and they wrote a story about how cool our blog was for and how neat it was that just regular fans could do this, and from that point on, we've been the Grizzlies blog. Here we are in 2015, and everyone knows Three Shades of Blue. Are you surprised at, at how quickly it uh, developed into something that people felt that it was a, uh, uh, we have to, a must, that we must check these guys out, we must read about these guys, and now we must listen to these guys on Saturday on the radio show. Does that surprise you at all? Oh, it does, you know, because, again, you know, we're, we're just fans. You know, we... we don't have journalism degrees for the most part, you know, even though some of us might have a, a little bit of a background there. And, you know, so it really is a matter of us just, you know, being passionate fans and and doing the what homework we can to to be able to, to hold ourselves to a certain, you know, standard so that people, you know, will read us and, and listen to us and at least, you know, respect what we have to say, even if they don't always agree with us. Chip, how have the, the Grizzlies themselves received this blog? They've been fantastic. I've had I've had the opportunity to interview Michael Heisley when he was not real popular, I think, and we gave his perspective, which he wasn't getting out in the normal media outlets, and that helped build his credibility here in town. We've had plenty of interviews with other players, with the the ownership groups, and through the change with the the front office. It's they've been more than bending over to help us, and it's just been a lot of fun being able to work with a group that's so accommodating. Josh, the radio show then uh, took flight, and obviously that's been a, a part of the whole Three Shades of Blue um, project, and uh, that's taken you to a different level. It really has. Uh, uh, Jonathan May, when we brought him on, you know, he, he really wanted to uh, for us to get into radio, and so that was something he kind of spearheaded, and uh, we brought on Philip Dean at that point to, uh, to be our executive producer, and, you know, it's... It's really taken off from that point. Uh, you know, we started that in uh, the beginning of last season. And so it's it's opened up new doors for us. You know, the, the amount of people that we've been able to talk to, as well as, you know, the, the people that want to talk to us about, you know, about the team. You get the website going, and then you, you read people's reaction to what you guys write. You get the radio going, you can interact with them verbally. Now you have these watch parties where not only do you get to talk to people, but you're actually meeting the people that respond to what you guys are doing. That's probably neat, Chip, to go out there and, and find what, put a face to these voices and maybe to the names as well. Uh, this is the most thrilling part of it at all that we've done, is the way we get to interact with fans and people who know who we are now and to share the experience, because it's one thing to to look at something and critique it, but it's quite another to share the experience with the people who are just as passionate about the team as we are. So this is a, really the highest point of the, of, the, of the experience for me, has been able to meet people and share our love for the team. Has a player ever said anything to you about something that's been written on the website? Uh, I can't think of anything that, that a player's addressed. A couple of the front office guys have contacted me when I when I haven't necessarily been uh, as kind to them as, as perhaps I should have. But you know, for the most part, it, it it's always well received. As you said, you guys are fans. You don't have the journalist uh, background as the journalism background. But with that said, and being a passionate fan, can you also let yourself be critical of the team when criticism is needed? I think we do a good job of that, actually. Uh, some people think we're a little bit too lenient on the team, but when something needs to be called out, we'll call it out. At the same time, when something doesn't, when people are being overly harsh, we like to bring out the other side. And like last season with Tayshaun Prince, we, I often would say, look, guys, you got to realize he lost 15 pounds in the preseason. He's come right in. This is not the player he could have been. And so we defend them, but we also criticize them when the right time. Josh, other blogs have been created that follow the Grizzlies, especially uh, as good as this team has become and this organization has become. There's going to be imitators. And there's going to be people trying to do that as well. And it's understandable. But uh, what do you think about now having having actual competition out there? Well, that's one of the things I actually talked about, uh, you know, with, with the amount of trades and things that have gone on in the NBA this season. I love the fact that we're finally getting some, some well-rounded, you know, views across the spectrum. So it, it's not just us and the Commercial Appeal and the Memphis Flyer. You know, you have these other great blogs out there that are putting their viewpoints out, and you know, they're, they're all they all have a different take, and so you know, it gives us that different perspective, and I think it's wonderful. What is next for Three Shades of Blue? Well, if Zach Thomas is just walking by. He's been working on trying to bring a TV show to the internet, 
and it's a lot more complicated than we thought, but we're trying to do that so you'll have three SOB TV and you can go and actually hear us going back and forth and talking among ourselves and hopefully we'll open it up where people can participate with that as well. Uh, beyond that, I don't know. I never thought it'd go this far. So it's always thrilled just to see what's going on. Chip, Josh, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks, for it. And speaking of the Grizz, hats off to Zach Randolph, who was recently named the NBA Player of the Week for the week ending on February 1st. Zebo averaged 20 and a half points, nearly 14 boards, and three dimes in four Grizzlies wins. The Grizz are in Minnesota tomorrow, then host Hot Atlanta on Sunday. And remember, we'll have the Tigers Temple matchup for you Saturday night at 1030 right here on WKNO. Finally, congrats to former Memphis Tigers Stephen Gostowski and Jordan Devy and former Ole Miss Rebel Brandon Bolden. The trio were all part of the New England Patriots dramatic Super Bowl 49 victory over the Seattle Seahawks. And that'll do it for now. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.